we have so been thrilled by the preaching of Brother Statler and the singing of the Barnetts. They've just lifted us to other heights. Thank you, Brother Parker, for taking a chance on a hillbilly. We thank you for that. Thank you, Brother and Sister Eads, for all that you have done to make our time comfortable. Thank you for your warm hospitality, uh, for your uh, smiles and your handshakes and your embraces. Uh, you certainly made us feel right at home. And we thank God for that. Above everything, we thank the Lord for being faithful to touch the frailty of man and allowing folk like me and Brother Paul just to be able to be held in his hand for a moment while he does the great thing that he does. And we thank God for every victory that's been won. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. And I'm calling your attention to the closing two verses of that chapter. Verses 20 and 21. Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. As you're turning there, I'm not going to ask you to stand today since we've already stood. But as you're turning there, you Bible readers realize that uh, the book of Romans is the premier disclosure of Pauline theology. If we want to know what the Apostle Paul believes, it would be beneficial, of course, to look at all that he offers us. But the book of Romans is quite a summation statement of what it is that he longs to share. As we turn into chapter 1, he begins with things that are universally recognizable to all, whether we're saved or not. He talks to us about things like uh, creation and uh, conscience. And then when we get to chapter 3, he talks about human history. Being a preacher, I've often said, I need another C, so I say chronology. But he gives us those things that we as theologians refer to as general revelation. Of course, general revelation is never quite enough. It's enough to help us recognize there is a God, but it's not quite enough to help us to understand what God's great plan for us is. And so, in addition to general revelation, we need what has become referred to as special revelation. And so, in chapter 3, we have this transition. And we move from chronology to the key character of all chronology. We move throughout history to the high point of history. And we find Christ in that third chapter as well. And it's upon this recognition of Christ that we begin to exercise faith in chapter 4. It's leading to our justification that is really solidified in chapter 5. And it's solidified on the merit of the blood of Christ. When we get down to verse 20 of chapter 5, we read, It's might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That it sin it reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. I've had folk ask in several different ways basically this same question. Why is it that God wastes so much of his time giving unto us two-thirds of his manuscript focused on instruction, a law, prophets, Something that's never able to make the comer therein too perfect to use language of the New Testament. Why would God do that? Well, as a passing point, I'll just simply remind you what you already know. God never wastes his time. God has a perfect plan, and I'm glad to remind you this morning that you are part of it. Somebody say amen. And he never wastes his time. Oh, I don't know if you're anything like me. You've probably stood before the mirror before and talked to the one that looks back at you. You recognize your frailties, your failures, your faults, your shortcomings. And you probably at times thought, Lord, what are you doing with this mess? Oh, Lord, I hate that you're wasting your time on me. But I promise you this morning, no matter where you've been, what you've done, who you are, saved or lost, it makes no difference. God never wastes his time. He has a perfect plan and you are in the center of it, thank God. Be to God. But why did he write it like this? Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. One of the things that I've loved about being part of the Southern uh, Camp Meeting is uh, your homespun, down-to-earth, we call it down-home uh, disposition and, and way of life. I just like it. It's made me feel so welcome and uh, easily becoming a part. I was reared in such an atmosphere and I trained under men that were quite grassroots in some way. And one of those men was a, is a man by the name of Pastor Eddie Porter. Brother Porter 
probably reads between a third and fifth grade level, at, at uh, that level. He uh, undoubtedly struggles with some type of disability in that area. But he has a mathematical mind, and uh, he has a fervent work ethic. And he started out years ago handling used tires, and now he has a multi-million dollar business. He's been used of the Lord in many ways to build up little churches all across Kentucky and Ohio. And I had the privilege to serve under him for a couple of years. Brother Porter would make statements every now and again that really at face value seemed like they were wrong. But the more you thought on them, the more they proved themselves right. For example, he said, it's not hard getting people saved. What do you think about that statement? It's not hard getting people saved. Well, if you're anything like me, and despite the fact that we've had wonderful victories around the altar, you're always looking for more, and I am, we might have a tendency to say, I don't know about that. If your little church has struggled to see the numbers grow, or it's been a while since someone's come into the doors and gotten under conviction and found their way to an altar of prayer, you might want to argue with that. But, but he went on to say, it's not difficult getting people saved. The hard part is getting people lost. Oh, now I understand. You see, it's only when we're sick that we'll ever seek a physician. It's only when we realize that we don't know our way that we'll ask for directions. It's only when we recognize the lostness of our soul that we'll ever reach out for a Savior. And what Brother Porter is saying is this. People will easily get saved if we can ever help them get to the place that they recognize how desperately they need to be saved. Everybody with me? Then I thought, I've heard that before. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. You see, the law was never intended to save anyone. The keeping of the law was never able to bring us unto that perfection. No, the giving of the law was granted unto us that we might recognize our lawlessness. The giving of the law was granted unto us that we might recognize how desperately we are inadequate. How, how desperately we need Jesus to step in, a Savior to come in and do what we and the law could not ever do. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The word there indicates transgression, lawlessness. Do you remember when sin was abounding? Do you remember when everywhere you turned and everywhere you looked, you found sin on every hand? You found it at work, you found it at home. The reason was it was in your heart, you found it everywhere. I have three children, some of you have graciously asked about them this week. Jacob, Hannah, and Andrew. Hannah's our only daughter, she's in the middle, sandwiched between two boys, and she is much like her mother, but she's much like her dad. And you put that combination together and look out, she's a spitfire. She had trouble with people when she was younger. She's grown to be a fine young lady, but uh, when she was younger, she had problems with folk. She had problems with her older brother, Jacob. Jacob was always a rather intelligent young man. He was always inquisitive. He'd be sitting in the back of the car on trips reading the dictionary just so he could tell us what some new word meant. And Hannah had problems with that. She asked me with all sincerity, Daddy, why can't he just be stupid? It would just have made it so much easier for her, you know. And then she had problems with her younger brother Andrew for years. They really clashed because she had prayed and prayed for a, for a sister and God didn't answer that prayer. She, she got a brother and so she had problems with that. She had problems with her mother and I'm going to tell you why. Because every time I look at my daughter who's now in her, young, uh, in her early 20s, I see my, my wife when I first met her. I see her so clearly and they're just like one another and sometimes they're just like this. Some of you mommies know about that. She had trouble with her dad. She said, Daddy, only time you ever want to talk to me is when you're going to tell me no or something else I can't do. One day I took her aside and I said, Hannah, has it ever dawned on you that if you have trouble with everybody in the whole wide world, that it might not be everybody else's problem. It might be yours. You know, there was a time in every life when sin, the offense, was so abounding, so abundant, because it radiated from within us that everything we touched fell to pieces. Everyone we dealt with was a problem. But the problem wasn't everything else and everyone else. The problem was us. It was within us. Moreover, the law entered 
that the offense, that this sin that transgresses the will of God might be recognized. It's abounding, it's abundant. More of the law enter that the offense might abound. I suppose if we had to close camp meeting this morning right there, we might walk out discouraged. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Yet we don't have to because the verse continues. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, <laughs> grace did much more abound. Where sin was abundant, grace was more abundant. When sin was on every hand, grace was already there. No matter how great sin might show itself, the grace of God was greater still. I know it's Sunday morning. I know it's closing day of camp. But I thank the saints of God, the recipients of grace, are one more time to say thank the Lord for the grace of God that's greater than all our sin. Hallelujah. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace to pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that's greater than all our sin. Now when we approach the scriptures, we need to handle them delicately, carefully. And I'm sure among this august crowd, there's many people that would have an idea of how we ought to apply proper hermeneutic and how we ought to study scripture appropriately but uh, I hail from the hills of Kentucky and so I'll just give it to you in a simplified format. I believe we should approach scripture using the funnel method you say I didn't read about that in seminary oh no but you picked one up the last time you were in the garage everyone know what a funnel is? It's a utensil that has a large mouth to keep shaking hands from spilling oil or whatever else all over the hot engine. But it runs down to a fine point that it might enter into where it needs to go. I believe when we look to the Word of God, we need to utilize the funnel method in the sense that the first thing we want to do is make sure we have the mouth in place. To make sure that we're seeing what some refer to as the primary point. Others call it the big picture. It is that key component that the Lord is really wanting to disclose to us. It's that thing that we dare not miss. No matter what else we might pick up, we've got to get the mouth of the funnel first. Everybody still awake? Say amen. And it's only when we have the mouth of the funnel properly in place that we can begin to delve into the details, ensuring that the details always complement the primary point. The details always amplify the, the purpose of the passage. Well, I just want to say this morning for those of you that won't wait and shout with me at the end that the primary point here is this. Grace is greater than all our sin. Hallelujah. Grace is greater than all of our sin. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what hell hold the devil may have drugged you through, the grace of our God is utterly sufficient to save you and sanctify you, to secure you and sustain you, to bring you in to his likeness and one day his presence. Hallelujah. Grace is greater. Wow, that's exciting. Three or four of you are excited with me. I like that. Thank you. The rest of you, maybe you're struggling. Am I, am I being overly complicated this morning? I didn't think I had capacity to be overly complicated. Well, let me make sure the cookies are on the bottom shelf. I'm saying, I'm saying, now, now all you old timers, all you old time Southern holiness folk, put your guns on safety. I know we don't believe in card playing. I mean, that's what you told me when I first met you. You said, we don't play cards, Brother Buck. We're holiness people. I'm like, oh, okay. And I didn't know. There's several things I didn't know. Then we'd go to your house and somebody would say, uh, want to play phase 10? Uh, preacher, you ever play Dutch Blitz? <laughs> Who know, Rook, whatever. And I always thought, wait a minute, I thought we didn't believe in card playing. Now, I'm not here to pick a fight. 
I know what you meant. You meant that you stand against those things that promote gambling and, and a poor stewardship. And, and you kind of just threw it out there like that. And, and really it wasn't the card that you were standing against. I understand that. But because I understand that and because you understand that, would you be a little gracious this morning? What I'm trying to say in a countryfied way of putting it, it really doesn't matter what hand the devil dealt you. Jesus has got an ace in the hole. It, it really doesn't matter what color he's called it because the master holds every trump card. Are you with me this morning? I'm telling you that grace is greater than all of your sin. Grace is greater than every manifestation of that sin. It doesn't matter this morning. You can spend endless hours telling me how bad that it is, but I'm telling you how great that it is this morning. Grace, grace, grace is greater than all of your sin. Moreover, the law entered that defense might abound, but where, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Hallelujah. That's the big picture that grace is triumphant over sin. That is the big picture that grace is God's trump card over sin. Don't you dare forget it. Now once that's established, well, we can dabble in the details if we like. I do at times like to dabble in details. If I'm not careful, I can get lost in them. And I notice that uh, we're talking about the Apostle Paul. I mean, if there is anyone that contributed to the New Testament being written, this man is certainly a qualified candidate. I mean, he has capacity. He's educated. He's traveled. He has status. He's religious. He's uh, zealous. He's certainly able. Of course, I believe that the Bible is God-breathed. Does anybody else believe that? For all you fancy folk among us, it's Theonoustos. It's God-breathed. Um, and, and I believe that means that God just allowed the Holy Spirit to roll over the heart and mind of the human authors that he's utilizing, superintending their activity, helping them that they might get it written just like he wanted it to be written. And by the way, I believe the Bible means what it says and says what it means. Somebody say amen. And so we believe in what's sometimes referred to as verbal plenary inspiration. That is, we believe the plenary portion means that we believe all of the Word of God is true. Let me make sure I'm with the right crowd this morning. Do we believe all the Word of God is true from Genesis to Revelation? But, but the verbal component means that we believe God chose certain words. I mean, He could have had this word, but He chose that word. And He chose specific words because they're of necessary value to us. And so we believe in both things can go together in perfect harmony. So with that being said, as I read this, I've often thought, what if it were written differently? I'm just offering some possibilities this morning. Can you see the Apostle Paul there leaning over some table or podium? He's writing there and He's laying his pen to the parchment and he's sensing the aiding of the Lord and he's pinning for all of us to read. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound and he comes to the conjunction and he says, but, uh, but, uh, hmm. but, 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 what if he had written when? But when sin abounded, grace did much more. Allow your hearts and minds to dwell on that for just a moment. And I believe what you'll find is the big picture doesn't change. The primary point is retained. But, but what does change is the difference that the detail might make. You see, if he would have been written when, he would have indicated a time. And do you know what the problem is with time? As I stare at this clock that's winding in front of me, it runs out. Years ago, we traveled in evangelism and we traveled in a motor home when our children was young. And we would come into revival meeting and camp meetings like this. You've had wonderful food this week. Amen, we've had good food. 
And so this is no indication of this particular camp meeting. But if you've been to many camps, you know that every camp meeting doesn't have real good food. I mean, I can only eat so many corn dogs and tater tots. And so we would find restaurants in the area. And, and probably to this day, my wife can tell you this closes at 9 until Friday evening. And then it extends to this time. She knows these things because we lived in that world for a few years. And uh, I remember one evening we had made up our minds. We had spotted a subway down the way. Uh, that's one of those real fancy places, guys, you take your wife to where they fix the food in front of you. Uh, we found a subway, and we had made up our minds. If we can get out of service in time, we're going to rush down there, and we're going to get us something different. We're going to get a subway sandwich. And so it so happened that night I somehow was helped to the Lord and didn't preach forever and we were able to get out and we were going to make it. We were just going to make it. We're so excited and we rushed down and, and, and we're getting the kids all out of the car and, and we go over to the door. We, we've got about 20 minutes. It's great. And we go to the door and we grab a hold of the door and we give it a tug and it doesn't go anywhere. We look at our watches. We look at the time. There's at least 20 minutes between. This, this shouldn't be. We give the door another pull, and it's, it's indeed locked. And Then we look inside, and we see about 17 teenagers in there. Have you ever noticed this occurrence? Where are all the grown-ups at? Has anybody else ever asked that question? There's about 17 kids in there all looking at each other, and one of them looks around at us and says, We're closed. And my wife looks at them and says, You're not supposed to be. <laughs> Sorry for us, though. Time's up. Can I testify to you this morning? I'm so glad as an eight-year-old boy laying in a hospital bed in Belfont, Kentucky, recognizing my lost condition. I'm so glad that when I slid my bony knees off the side of that hospital bed and planted them down on the cold tile floor and began to try to weep my way through to victory, I'm so, God, I'm so glad God didn't say, oh, sorry. If you'd have just got here last revival meeting, if you would have just gotten in at the last camp, if you, if you would have just called on me yesterday, it'd been no problem, but, but I'm closed today. Hey, I've got good news this morning. Someone said God's watch keeps perfect time. <laughs> and by the way, do you know what time is the right time to get saved? Behold, now is the time accepted. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The time to make things right with God is right now. Somebody say amen. And I'll make you this promise. God's door will never be locked the way will never be closed. It will always be the right time. But that's the problem with time that runs out. Hmm. You see him there? More of the law entered that the offense might abound, but, but, hmm. but when? No, that, that's not right. What if he would have written, but how sin abounded? Grace did much more abound. But how sin abounded? Well, dwell on that for just a moment, and I think if you do, you'll find that the big picture doesn't change. I think if you do, you'll recognize the primary point remains the same, and I hope that you're catching on to something. I don't think you can find a word to plug in here that's going to change the fact that grace is always going to be greater than our sin. Hallelujah. But the detail would have made a difference if he would have written how. It would have indicated a means or a method. You know what the problem is with means and methods? Sometimes they're just too hard. I've been so upset this week. The only complaint, the only complaint that I have for the Southern Bible Methodist camp is this limitation of having to be 12, 5 to 12 to ride the zip line. I promise you Sister Buckler and I would have ridden that zip line if you would have only given us a chance. But I was trying to be a law-abiding citizen while I was here. Sometimes things are just too hard. You know, if it took a foot race to get to heaven, I mean, if we would line them up out here, Pastor John, and, and we would let folk go two by two, and whoever won would be accepted, and we'd bring them into the church and make them a part of Bible Methodism and ultimately let them go into the kingdom. Well... That'd be all right for some of us. Paul Stetler, he's a runner. He can handle it. I mean, don't look at me like that. I'm no Paul Stetler, but I can handle it. I mean, I have been picking out who I want to run against, but I mean, I have enough capacity. I can handle that. But what about the individual? 
but can't put one foot in front of the other? What about the person who doesn't have strength to stand? If it took an if they took the writing of some type of intellectual paper, the presentation of a lecture about theology that one might get into the kingdom, I, I, I think I'd be okay. But what about the person that can't even collect his or her thoughts? I hope this doesn't mess up your theology, but as an eight-year-old boy, praying by that hospital bed, having grown up in the church, having grown up under godly influences, I, I really didn't know anything at that moment except I was lost. And I just begin to cry out to God in the way that an eight-year-old boy would. And do you know somehow God was big enough to understand my prayer? Somehow God was capable of understanding all that mess that I was giving unto him. By the way, God's never complicated the way. Somebody say amen. You say, well, what is God's way? What is God's method? Whosoever shall call upon the name the Lord the same shall be saved I promise you this morning if you'll cry out to God in your condition it doesn't matter if you know or you don't know it doesn't matter if you have adequate understanding or not when your heart reaches out to God in sincerity God will hear you and help you every time thank God moreover the law entered that the offense might abound you see but when, no, that's not right. But how, no, that, that's, that's not it. <sighs> but where sin abounded? Let me ask you this morning, have you, ever, have you ever been thinking on something, struggling with, you know, and all of a sudden you just have a great idea? You ever do that? That probably wasn't you. <laughs> all that other stuff was you, all that other stuff with me. But that was the moment where God just kind of broke through. And give truth. And I'm so glad that God broke through and gave truth here. And I'm glad we have the word here where. Instead of how or when. It doesn't indicate a time. It doesn't indicate a means or method. It indicates a place. And I'm proposing this morning. It's a place called grace. It's a place where sinners can be saved. A place where backsliders can be restored. A place where sick folk can be healed. A place where hearts can be purified. A place where direction can be offered. A place where strength can be given. A place where encouragement can come. A place where we can find support for the battle. It's the place that you and I can come to where God gives us of his infinite supply. And I'm so thankful this morning that there is still a place called grace that one could find. Somebody say amen. You say, oh, preacher, preacher, preacher. I just think you have gone beyond the, the license that's given unto you. You've stretched it too far this morning. A place called grace. I've read the Bible through more times than you are years alive, and I've never seen a place called grace. Really? What version of Scripture are you reading? You've never seen the place called grace? What about the time when a mob of men brought a lady to Jesus caught in the very act of adultery? They begin to say to him adamantly that Moses in the law says she ought to be stoned. What do you think we ought to do? Anybody remember this story? Strangely enough, when they asked Jesus that. Forgive me for coming down on a Sunday morning. You say, that's uh, it's a little inappropriate on a Sunday morning. Uh, ignoring people is a little inappropriate as well. But that's what Jesus did. Just doodling in the sand. Master, master, are... Are you going to answer us or not? She ought to be stoned, right? Do you want us to stone her? He looks up for just a moment and says, I'll tell you what, you that are without sin, you go ahead and cast the first stone. And if you might allow the narration to step in and leave me be, I'm writing something on the ground. And the Bible says it goes back to writing it. 
I've always read this passage and wondered, what in the world did he write on the ground? You ever thought about that? I've read after some folk. Nobody knows. I recognize that this morning. But I've read some possibilities. My good co-worker used the word speculation the other day. And so could I just speculate a moment? Someone said, I think, that when he knelt down the first time, he began to write the law. Those moral codes that govern all of us. And then the next time, (laughs) he began to write the name of those men present next to the code that they're guilty of breaking. Because if you're guilty of any of the law, you're guilty of the whole. I don't know if that happened or not, but I do know this. I know if I come in pointing my finger at you and telling how sinful you were, and all of a sudden God pointed his finger at me and told me how sinful I was, I'd I'd change my plans. Keep the stone. See after all. Someone said, no, no, that's not what he did. What he did was he knelt down the first time and he wrote the name of the lady that they brought to him on the ground. Now, somebody's here and they're thinking right now, I never read her name. I don't think it's in Scripture. I promise you this, it might not be in Scripture, but it is in the mind and heart of God. He knows everybody. He knows every name. He knows every circumstance, every situation. He knows everything about this young lady. Those folks say that when he knelt down the first time, he wrote her name on the ground, and then after that, when he knelt down again, he began to write the name of those men that were present that were just as guilty of adultery as she was, Maybe even with her. I spent 12 years in the pastorate. I pray to God I never have to again. I'm a terrible pastor. God grew my churches and helped people love me. I don't know how that ever happened, but it just it's not my gift set. But I will give you a little pastoral advice this morning for all you critical carnal people among us. Look at me. I'm talking to you. Look at me a minute. <laughs> I have found in my 12 years of pastoring sometimes folk that pointed their finger the most and cried out in the greatest condemnation against people in their times of failure and suffering were many times the most guilty people of the very same thing. Strange. I would imagine if these men brought someone into Jesus and said she needs to be stoned because she's an adulter- adulteress and all of a sudden he points out, well, you're an adulterer, I suppose that would do it. They'd probably want to drop stones and go. But we don't know. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Or I guess my guess is as good as yours. So here's my guess. What if he just stepped down the first time and began to score G R A? What do you want to do, Master? Well, if you don't have any sin, just stone her. C E Grace. You say, Preacher. Jesus didn't write grace on the ground. Well, you don't know that, but I know this. Whether he wrote it on the ground or not, here's a lady coming in smitten by sin that's going to go out and sin no more. Here's a lady coming in destined to die that's going out with merit to live. Here's a lady that everyone else had stood against now that finding Jesus is willing to stand for her and with her. Whether it's written on the ground or not, it does not change the reality when she lifted her tear dimmed eyes. And he said, woman, where is those thine accusers? And she looked around her in amazement and said, Lord, I don't have it. And he says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. No matter what was written, that was a place called grace. I've just never seen it, preacher. Really? You've never read about the two fellows that were sons of the father? The one says to daddy, I'll have what's coming to me. Then he takes that and he runs off and he lives it up until the money's all gone, the friends have all departed, and the party's over. And now just to stay alive, he's feeding pigs. And he's so desperate and so hungry and in such need that he's thinking to himself, I might just have to eat what I'm handing out. What a pitiful condition. And in the midst of this story, you Bible readers know there's this beautiful phrase. One day he came to himself. And I just want to remind you that when he came to himself, he didn't do that by himself. 
That is the faithfulness of our high and holy God. And if you're here among us this morning and you're stricken by sin and it just looks like the offense is abounding everywhere, I'm just praying that you'll come to yourself. But I know you won't do that by yourself. It'll be the holy hands of God drawing. And so if you feel him compelling this morning, don't, don't question, don't be afraid, will he receive me because he's the one that's inviting in the first place. This man came to himself and said, what am I doing here? Dying of hunger. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to go back to my father's house. And he pulled himself up by the grace of God out of the muck and the mire of the pig pen and he started heading home. Everybody with me? And when I read this story, it seems to me that on his way home, he decides, I need a testimony. I need a little help from the crowd this morning. I will be done before the... I know what happens to Cinderella's cherry. I know, I know, at 12 o'clock. I'll be done, okay? Just stay with me. Um, you remember when you first got saved? Can you remember when, the first time you testified? Just run through the roll decks of your memory. Do you remember that? I do. Now, you may think, oh... Brother Buckler, he can just jump up in front of people and talk. There's no problem at all. But I am one of the most backward folk you'll know. I, I, really, I really struggle at times. And uh, when I was young, I, I, just, I just couldn't testify at all. It, just, it was the most difficult thing in the world. But God had done something for me, and so I wanted to testify. And so, now don't you dare judge me. Don't you dare judge me. But I, I thought to myself, you know, I, maybe I ought to practice don't look at me like that. I'm not the Lone Ranger in this building, I promise you. I thought to myself, you know, I should, I should try to think about what I want to say, and when I get a chance, I'll, I'll share that. And so I just began praying about it and working on it, and, and it, it kind of started coming together. And when it started coming together, I started feeling better about it and gaining confidence. And before long, I started gaining a lot of confidence. And I, I thought, wow, th th this, is, this is really pretty good and, and, I, and I started thinking you know what oh sister so and so she'll probably shout about right there and, and brother what's his name you know he's always ready he'll probably get on his feet about right there I mean this is just what I'm thinking as a, as a little boy and I went to church that night ready to testify for the first time. And, and we had what some call a popcorn service. Everybody's just popping up over and over. And, and, and every time I try, somebody else would pop up. And, and the more I waited, the, the faster my heart beat. And the more I waited, the sweater of my palms became. The more I waited, the more stressful I become. And I thought, I'm not going to get to testify at all. And finally, finally I found a place. And I, I jumped up. In the midst of all those others testifying, and I, and I delivered my, my beautiful remarks. Except they didn't quite work out like I thought they would. Instead of that earth shattering, eternity drawing discourse that I thought I was going to give, it came out something like this. <laughs> Now let me tell you what a great home church I had. Sister so-and-so still shouted. Brother Watts, his name still got on his feet. And I was still encouraged despite myself. Thank God for the saints. But it seems to me that that's what's happening to this young man as he makes his way home. He's wasted it all. Marred daddy's name. Felt so miserably. Could be the talk of the town. And he starts to try to testify. What can I tell dad? Maybe I'll start with, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. You know, he doesn't have to let him back in. He doesn't have to receive him. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm, I'm not, not even worthy to be a son. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm not worthy to be a son. Just, just make me a servant. And as he rolled that over in his mind, he said, Oh, God, please help that work. Help that work. Help that work. Now, I don't in any way really want to step outside the bounds of Scripture, but, but can I paint this picture in a way that I think a southern crowd might understand? Yes, this boy has... Defame the family. Yes, this boy has wasted his inheritance. Yes, this boy is a mess in the muck and mire of sin. But what this boy doesn't realize is the love of his daddy. And if you would allow it, 
I just want to propose the possibility that every day from the time that young boy ran away, turning his back on family, the father said, Mama, I'll take my coffee on the front porch. And every day, he'd go out and turn that chair in the direction that he watched his son go off. And as he'd sip that coffee, he'd have little prayers like this, Father, keep your hand on my boy. Father, bring him back to me. Father, I don't care where he's been. I don't care what he's done. Would you, would you just help him make it home? You say, Preacher, You've gone beyond exegesis of some eisegetical uh, conglomeration. You don't know that's the way it happened. I'm sure it didn't happen just like that. But I've never met a daddy that didn't weep over a wayward boy. And I've never met a mother that didn't shed tears for one that's gone astray. And I can promise you this, any mama, any daddy worth their salt that sees their child go against the grain of God is going to find a place to pray and they're going to prepare a heart for reception. And if you're here this morning and you're the wayward one, I just want to promise you, you are going to be sweetly surprised when you make it back because it's not going to be refusal that you receive, but they're going to welcome you readily. Somebody say amen. amen. Bring my boy home. What if? What if what we can't see and what we don't read is that that particular morning he's sipping coffee and having that prayer when all of a sudden he sees the silhouette of a man slip up over the horizon and he says as his heart begins to do somersaults is that him? Is that him? Is that my boy? As coffee spills and the rocking chair rocks in his absence, is that him? As he runs out to meet him, is that him? That's him. <laughs> That's him. And out in the open field, a rebellious son and a receiving father collide. And that boy tries to give that testimony. Father, I've sinned against heaven, but the father won't hear it. The father squeezes that boy up in his bosom and while he's trying to tell him how bad he's been, the father said, somebody kill the fatted calf. You don't understand. I'm not worthy to be your son. Bring me a brand new pair of shoes. You don't understand. I'll just be a servant. Somebody find the signet ring. My boy has come home. Father, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. But what that young man didn't realize as he wasn't coming home on, the, on his worth, on his merit. He was being received by daddy that day because somewhere between the front porch and the pig pen, that father and son was embracing on a place called grace. There's many faces this morning, names that I don't know, but this one thing I do, no matter where you've been or what you've done, Time hasn't run out. The means and methods are not too, come on, are not too hard. There's a place called grace that can be found. And I promise you this, if you'll come to that place, I've got confidence in this crown. There'll be mommies and daddies, grandmas and grandpas, husbands and wives, children.